I invite you to turn again in your scriptures to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13 is our text this morning. Last week, we finished up chapter 3, where we received from Hebrews an exhortation to examine our hearts, lest we be hardened by unbelief. And so using the example of Moses and the Israelites, um, the author already indicated that the promise of a land inheritance to Israel um, was in fact but a type pointing to a greater And here's one of those big words, eschatological rest. So before we go through with our study of the text this morning, I want to explain that word. What do we mean by eschatological rest? Well, it's a big word that simply describes the end of all things. Okay, so when we talk about eschatology, we're talking about the end, the the telos, the, the, the place at which all things terminate. Right, insofar as God designed the world to come to this certain point. So when we speak of eschatology, you know, from the 1970s, 80s, and forward, that word kind of got hijacked, and we think of helicopters and explosions and just, you know, terrible things happen the day of Armageddon, all of that. But what we mean when we speak of biblical eschatology is that goal for which God created the world. That from the beginning, God didn't just create man and woman and all the creatures and the plants and say, well, let's see what happens. But no, in fact, he had a plan, a purpose from the very beginning. right? And that was a plan to bring mankind into an eternal state of blessedness and reward. Now, what the author does now is make that point quite explicit. Continuing with his study or his exposition, rather, of Psalm 95. And what we're going to see is that the very thing we receive by faith in Christ is that rest, that blessedness, that eternal reward that God promised from the beginning with his covenant in Adam, or in his covenant with Adam. You see, for Adam, it was to be gained through works. That was the covenant of works. That failed, and God entered into a covenant of grace. And in that covenant, it is gained through faith in Jesus Christ, who himself has earned our way into God's rest. So with that, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 1 through 13. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. 
Our Father, we come to you now. Lord, though weak and trembling, yet joyful and expectant, we pray, dear Lord, that you would enable understanding on our part. We pray, Lord, that this word would fall on our ears and be received, heard, that God, you would enable us to respond in the obedience of faith. Father, I ask that you would strengthen me to deliver this word, that it would be only your word spoken this morning, not the word of man. That God, you would build up this flock and that you would continue, Lord, to um, Lord, grow us in the depths of our understanding and in our communion and fellowship with you. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, in, uh, in one sense, this passage basically makes one straightforward point. And that's simply that we enter into God's eternal rest through faith in Jesus Christ as a response to hearing the word of God. All right, state that again. We enter into God's eternal rest through faith in Jesus Christ in response to hearing the word. That is quite simple and straightforward. However, um, you may have also noticed that there's quite a bit of detail in these 13 verses that we've read. There's a lot going on in this passage because, again, it's referencing back to not only Psalm 95, but a lot of the, the cultural, traditional understandings of the Jewish people, of the Hebrew people. And so what that means is we have to, to work a little bit to grasp a couple of very important Old Testament themes as they're developed from Genesis all the way through uh, to the New Testament. And so before we attempt to, to work our way through the teaching of this text um, point by point, I want to start by simply noting that the, the central focus of our passage today is an exhortation to pursue entrance into God's rest by faith. So we've already had a number of warnings, and, and chief among them last week uh, was the warning against disobedience, which continues here. But now the author moves on into this explicit idea of, of, of rest and that call to pursue or strive to enter into God's rest, which we're going to uh, explain further later on. Uh, but as we saw in verse 9, part of what's in view with that rest is the idea of Sabbath rest. And so the author's making a connection to what the Sabbath represents. He's saying this Sabbath rest, that is what is embodied in the Sabbath principle as it was instituted in the very beginning when God rested on the seventh day, what's embodied there is realized in Christ. Right, that, that's what he's pressing toward. And, and the reason that is important is because it teaches us that the promise in view here, this rest, it's one that goes all the way back to the beginning of creation, all right, to sinless creation. Because the Sabbath was created there. All right? in, in the creation account, we see the six days of God working, bringing forth, forming, and making all that is and then on the seventh day in Genesis 2, we find that God rested from his works and that he de declared that day to be holy. And as a result, that day, the seventh day, was to be a Sabbath day of rest for Adam. And that means then what was promised to Israel in the form of the promised land, while true and wonderful, it was only pointing to that same eternal rest that the weekly Sabbath was itself pointing to, though with an added meaning of rest from sin. And so that is why it's relevant to us. Okay, The Sabbath instituted in Genesis 2, the Sabbath instituted in the Law of Moses, those are not things that are irrelevant to us. But the author of Hebrews says, no, again, it all fits together. It's all part of this one grand plan, ultimately to point us to that eternal rest for which we were created. And as this text shows us, this rest of which we're speaking is a perpetual rest, an eternal rest. Why? Because God's perfect work 
on the seventh day was complete. And the goal was for Adam the creature to enter into that perpetual rest by fulfilling the covenant of works through perfect obedience to God. And unfortunately, as we know, he failed through sinning against God. He, he had forsaken that rest to come. And at that point, his labors became toilsome. They became difficult. They became painful. But because God is a gracious God, he condescended to enter into that covenant of grace. And the promise of entering into God's rest remained. It didn't go away. And that's what the promised land typified, if you will. Again, a type is merely something that represents a, a spiritual reality, points forward to something else. And in one way, the whole idea of the promised land kind of recapitulated Genesis 3. Right? Adam was to enter into this eternal promised rest through obedience. Well, Israel was to enter into the promised land through faith, or rather through the obedience of faith. But we saw that never by their obedience could they earn the right to be in God's rest. So it showed that man is unable to enter God's rest through works. But in another way, it showed that now the only way to enter is through that faith in response to God's word. And so in Christ, the reality is seen in its fullness that the very thing that we were created for, uh, which our souls innately long for, is extended to us. That rest for our souls, which we have read about and which we have heard about already this morning. So for us, we must heed the negative example of Israel in the wilderness and pursue Christ by faith. Because he has secured our entrance into this rest. That is, for everyone who holds fast their confidence to the end. And so as we've already indicated, we enter that rest by faith. That's what these first three verses really emphasize, the key being there in verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who heard. The word of God must be received by Believing, And what this is, is really nothing other than an explanation of that reformational principle of sola fide, that is faith alone. And that is the rest being spoken of is that full reality of salvation in Christ. And the way we receive it is not through works, not through good deeds, but rather through faith. And the first reality that we're really confronted with in this passage is first the fact that the promise of entering this rest still remains, right? That's the good news. Because if that was a temporary promise or one that was not lasting, then whenever Israel failed to enter God's rest by obedience, then that would have been the end of the promise. And therefore, there'd be nothing for us. But the author is showing to his readers, his hearers, that know the promise still remains. That's the very reason there is the warning. That's the very reason there's the encouragement and exhortation to hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and trust in Christ Jesus. To state it differently, Israel's unfaithfulness didn't nullify God's promises. And maybe you can recall the Apostle Paul saying something to that effect in Romans 3, 3 and 4, where he asked, What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And so praise God for that. That he's not a God who's reactionary and who changes his mind when he sees the unfaithfulness of people. God knows the unfaithfulness of people. But God is true to his promises, which is why the promise remains for us. It still stands. But it's interesting here that he uses the language of fear. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Well, what is it that we're to fear? Well, we need to first clarify that he is not saying that we should doubt. That's not a fear of, oh, I just don't know if... If, if 
if I'm going to be brought into this rest. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know. He's not calling us to have doubt of God's promises, nor the certainty of God's promises. What he's calling us to fear is a possibility of unfaithfulness on our part. You see, what's clear that was going on was there was an ir irreverent attitude toward the word of God among the hearers here. And we see that not only in chapter 4, but really going all the way back to chapter 1. Remember, there was questions about the rank of Jesus compared to the angels. You know, the angels were messengers of God. Jesus was a messenger, messenger of God. And there seemed to be an overall just lack of reverence toward the word of God. And so what he's calling them to is to have a godly, reverent fear. I always think when I read a passage like this of the hymn Amazing Grace, and maybe I've mentioned this before, but... You know the line in there that says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." And I've always thought that was such an interesting line, but it's so true because what grace does is it enables us, brings us to know the living God. And when we come to know the living and true God, the proper response is a godly fear that presses us toward faithfulness. Now, it's not the type of fear uh, which we have towards something that, you know, endangers us and is evil. It's the type of fear we have of reverent awe, where we sit before something and we were so taken and captivated by its immensity, by its grandeur, by its majesty, and by our relative smallness, if that's even a word, compared to that thing. And so for the hearers, what the author's getting at here is that a lack of fear, a lack of reverent awe toward God would indicate a failure to hear the word, or at least a failure to listen to and heed that word. Now that's why it's so important then to stand upon good doctrine. And now typically in the Reformed churches, you know, we, we make a very big deal out of good doctrine, but for good reason. And we never want to take it for granted. Because the reality is the, the tendency of the human heart is to create a God in our own image. Right? We create a God if we just conceive of him however we would like in, in our likeness, one that represents us. And any God that we conceive of in that way will not be holy and awesome. He'll be subservient to us. He'll be a genie just to serve our own needs and wants and desires. But good doctrine lifts up God before us and shows us who he is, the self-contained trinity. And from knowing and coming to know who he is, it moves us to stand in awe. That good doctrine comes from standing upon this word, heeding this word, learning from it, and living in it. So again, as we mentioned from verse 2, Good news has come to us the same as it's come to Israel. The difference between us, that is those who walk by faith, and those who failed to enter God's rest in the promised land is just that, faith. Again, we read in Romans where it says, so faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Calvin, commenting on this, observes very aptly, he says, the word never puts forth its power in us except when faith gives it, an, gives it an entrance. It is indeed the power of God unto salvation, but only to those who believe. Now, just in passing observation here, but part of what this verse reminds us, and the rest of this section for that matter, is that the author views the Christian community as the heirs of the divine promises made to Israel. Right? He sees no distinction there, no separate sets of promises, but they are one and the same. There's a continuity there. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But one of the things the author is really point pressing into is that a, a true faith, the faith that he's calling for, leads to an obedience that flows from that faith. And that's the same thing that James talks about in James 2. It was in verse 26. Right? He says, a faith, faith without works is dead. 
what he's getting at is that a true faith that exists will result in the fruit of works. It's a very simple concept. We all know this. But it's the fact that we act upon what we believe. All right? So if I believe that the floor is going to fall out from underneath of me, I'm going to move. If I believe the chair is going to hold me up, then I'm going to sit down in it, and so on and so forth. Now, faith is much, much more than that, but certainly no less. It's no less than a true belief that results in an action or actions on my part. And so if obedience is a, a struggle, and I mean if obedience is hardly seen in our lives, then that means I need to press further into what God says. Because faith comes through hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. And the call for us is to be united with those of faith, those who listened, lest we fail to enter into God's rest as Israel did. And so the author continues then by referring back to Psalm 95 and verse 3, as I swore in my rest, or in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. But what he's doing there now is actually contrasting that um, with the reality that's before us. Right? So the fact that unbelief resulted in failure to enter God's rest means the converse must be true. Belief, faith, results in entering God's rest. One commentator put it this way that Faith brings into the present the reality of that which is future, unseen, or heavenly. For that reason, those who have believed can be said to enter God's rest already. Which brings him then to explain further that rest was the goal from the beginning. Now, we've already explained this, I think, fairly well, so we won't dwell on it too long. But nevertheless, we do want to make sure we address this thoroughly enough that rest was the goal from the beginning. Again, the promised land was only a type right, of that true spiritual and that word eschatological rest uh, to which it pointed. And the real meaning of this rest goes back to the original creation. Six days God worked and formed the earth and the creatures and everything therein. On the seventh day, he rested because his works were complete. And man's end was to enter into that rest upon the completion of his works that God had given him. Now, we must recognize that this rest that we're speaking about, both as it pertains to us and as it pertains to Israel, is being viewed through the covenant of grace. All right? We talked about that in Sunday school a little bit. That's why the unity of the covenant of grace is so important to understand. It's because we stand in that same sort of covenant that Israel did. That is a gracious covenant. Now, the point in referencing Genesis 2, um, that is the institution of the Sabbath, is to show the eternal principle that was at play there. Okay, That was given prior to sin. It's so important to, to grasp that. The Sabbath principle was established prior to sin's entrance into, world, or into the world. Man failed in that covenant and therefore failed to enter into that rest in the Garden of Eden. But then God entered into that covenant of grace, which is good news to Israel. It's good news to us. Because again, though man failed, God is faithful. God is gracious. And so with that in our minds then, I want you to look at verses 4 and 5. And let's press into what, what this means for salvation to be rest. Well, this is where man's existence as a, as a replica of God's heavenly existence comes in. And if you'd been, on, been with us on Wednesday nights in our previous study, you've heard a fair little bit about this. But the general idea is that God created the highest heavens. And if you go to Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, it kind of explains this. It talks about how the things on earth are but types and shadows or copies of the heavenly things. All right, and just as an example, the, the earthly tabernacle described in the book of Exodus, erected there at the end of the book of Exodus, which later came to be the temple there in Jerusalem, that was a, a copy or a shadow of the true heavenly temple or the heavenly tabernacle. 
And the importance is it's that heavenly tabernacle into which Christ has entered, right? He didn't enter into a tabernacle made of human hands, but rather the true tent in heaven. That's where he offered his sacrifice, and that's where he procured entrance into God's presence, entrance into God's rest for the people of God. Now, all of that's important because salvation is a little bit hard to understand if we don't have a grasp on what was intended from the beginning. As we've already said, that entrance into the heavenly temple, into that heavenly rest, that was the goal. We refer to Adam's time in the Garden of Eden and his task given to fill the earth and have dominion. We refer to that as a probationary period, meaning there was a set time. We're not told what it was, but there was certainly an end that God had determined that if Adam was faithful to this to accomplish these tasks in whatever given period of time, then he would have sealed and secured entrance into that eternal rest for himself. Well, obviously he didn't. And so God's plan of salvation, his purpose and plan to redeem you and me from our sins through Christ, what that's ultimately about is restoring us to what was intended for man from the beginning. Entrance into that rest, into that perfect existence with him. Genesis 2.2 says, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. <coughs> I say all that to say this, that means then that in Genesis 1 and 2, in a world prior to sin, the Sabbath existed for Adam as a reminder, as a day set aside for him to remember that he is not designed to toil and labor in a perpetual cycle that never ends, but rather at the end of his work, there comes a rest that is promised from God. That weekly Sabbath was a reminder of that, to keep pressing toward the goal which he would receive if he were to uphold the terms of the covenant. Richard Gavin puts it this way, and he's describing the Sabbath both then and now for that matter. He says, it is for restful reflection on our lives before God in view of the ultimate outcome of history. Restful reflection before God. Looking forward to that ultimate outcome, that rest for our souls. Verse 6 says then, Therefore it remains... Since therefore it remains for some to enter, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken of another day later on. In essence, it's saying that since Entering into God's rest is the ultimate end goal for the people of God. The day of salvation is always today. As we said at first, because Israel's unfaithfulness did not nullify the faithfulness of God, all it meant is that those who hardened their hearts and rebelled did not gain entrance. But the converse is true. All those who hear God's word and believe that word, receive it by faith, they do gain entrance. Entrance and, and the emphasis for the author today is he's taking Psalm 95 and applying it to his hearers and saying, Look, that's why this is an abiding word. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And he even points out Joshua. And this is interesting because Joshua 21, verse 45, we read it, it said, Not one word of all the good promises of the Lord that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All had come to pass. And prior to that, it even said he gave them rest on all sides from their enemy. 
well, who was it that entered into the promised land? That same text went on to tell us it was those who were obedient, who listened to the word of God spoken through Moses and responded in faith. Now, we know it wasn't a perfect faith by no means. We know that the later generation certainly rebelled and ultimately showed their sinfulness and unfaithfulness. But what that event is for us is, again, a type to illustrate the principle, this eternal principle, that those who hear the word of the Lord and respond in faith gain entrance into the rest of God. And the fact then that it tells us there in verse 9, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God, makes the same point that that rest is not fulfilled. It's still extended out to us. And even more than that, it shows us that ultimately, Israel, the promised land, was not about simply gaining that land. It was to point us to something greater. And that greater rest is the concern of our author here in this passage. And so as we think about then, what does it mean, a Sabbath rest for the people of God? I think we've talked about that quite clearly, but I want to speak just a moment on why does he use that term Sabbath? In other words, what does the weekly Sabbath, the Lord's Day, look like for us now? Well, the term Sabbath rest, it's a Greek word, uh, and it carries the basic meaning of an observation or celebration of the Sabbath. All right, And, and the point is, it's not been taken away, made not available to us, nor has it been rendered unnecessary. And, and that's perhaps a key point, because some of the Reformers even differed on this point. Maybe you've heard that there's a, a difference in the continental view of the Sabbath versus the English or Westminsterian view of the Sabbath. Well, uh, Calvin was certainly a, a proponent of the continental view, and part of what he came to, to believe, and let's qualify this, he's a great exegete. Right? Calvin is great with the text, but he did reach some conclusions that weren't uh, exactly warranted. And one of those was that, in fact, the Sabbath principle has been completely fulfilled. And so in Cal Calvin's view, really every day is supposed to be a Sabbath. Every day should be composed of corporate worship. And that's why he attempted there in Geneva to have corporate worship every single day, but he conceded that it wasn't feasible under most circumstances, and so still maintained that it was wise and good to have the Lord's Day as a special day for Sabbath observance. But what Calvin did there was really kind of overrealize the eschatology or the teaching of the scriptures on the Sabbath. As Gaffin said, it's a day for restful reflection on God and his intention for the end of all things. And the reality is, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, the end has not come yet. Jesus said the final enemy to be defeated is death death. Then the end comes. Then comes our full realization of this rest that we are to come into. Until then, it is right and good to have that day upon which we rest and come together for worship in response to God's promises. And that's an abiding call from Genesis 2, repeated in the moral law of Exodus chapter 20 that we ought to keep the Sabbath. Only when Christ return will, returns will the Sabbath fully pass away. But until then, we cling to what Christ has provided. We cling in obedience to that word that he has given us, the means of grace, regeneration, faith, and everything else that the Sabbath points us to. It's meant to strengthen in us these things. It is as itself, broadly speaking, a means of grace. And so if we're resting in Christ, then His commands are not burdensome, they're life-giving. And we delight in the Lord's Sabbath. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from His works as God did from His. Verse 10. To repeat there something we mentioned earlier. The reality 
of what Christ has secured makes it so that by faith we can be said to truly possess these heavenly promises. We have entered into God's rest in the sense that it is secure, it is undeniable, it will not be taken from us. But nevertheless, we're still looking forward to that ultimate day when it is made complete by the return of our Lord. So that final section then returns to this idea of the Word, which calls us into this rest. It points out that the Word which calls us to rest is inescapable. Let's explain what we mean by that. What it is, is it calls us to remember that the Word of God is that which calls us to enter His rest. We've seen that. But the point it makes is that from that Word we cannot hide. The Word of God reaches all either drawing to salvation or driving to ruin. That's really the idea of, of what it means when it says that the word is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the depths of the soul of bone and marrow. But it tells us in verse 11, first, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Not striving, not in the sense of work, right, as in obedience or, or, or deeds that produce, you know, salvation, but rather in the sense of be eager, right? It's, it's this ardent desire. It's this hungering and thirsting for the rest that God provides through the righteousness of Christ. But the reality is, and why this is even in here, is because resting is a hard thing to do. It really is. Now, don't get me wrong, complacency isn't a hard thing to do. Sluggishness isn't a hard thing to do. But truly, resting is. Because think about all the things which prevent us from rest. Things like anxiety, things like worry, difficulty, pain, heartache, on the list goes. Those things don't magically vanish whenever Christ comes to us and we receive Him. Those things will still be with us. The struggle will still be there and real every day. But what the Scripture teaches us is that what Christ says, He gives us a reprieve from those things when we listen to Him by faith. And by reprieve, I mean He doesn't make them go away, but rather He gives us somewhere to run to. He gives us refuge. He gives us solace. He gives us rest. As we read in Matthew 11, or as we read in Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Or one of my favorites, Psalm 13, where the psalmist says, How long, O Lord? And he speaks of his heartache, his struggle, his, his toils, his anguish. But at the end he says, Yet my heart will rejoice in the Lord. Why is he able to say that? It's because the psalmist found rest in knowing God, ultimately, through the Redeemer. The same way that we do, we find rest in knowing God through the saving work of Jesus Christ. The call of this text is to know it, seek it, to pursue it, lest we wander into disobedience and fail to enter. Finally, these verses 12 and 13, they simply make explicit what we've already said. But there's no neutrality uh, before the Word of God. There's a good parallel to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. There Paul writes, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death to the other, a fragrance from life to life. See, the idea there is, again, the Word of God pierces the soul, and it becomes either a means to the circumcision of a heart, to use the, continue the imagery, or a means of slaying the unbeliever in sin. Now, I once had a guy, he was a big J. Vernon McGee fan. Um, he used to be a real popular Bible teacher uh, decades ago. But he challenged me on this text one time. Uh, he was actually visiting our church, and one of the first questions he wants to know is, well, do you believe that the soul is, or do you believe that uh, man is, is, is uh, composed of uh, 
Three parts or two parts? Do you believe he's body, soul, and spirit, or just body and soul? And you know, I told him, like, well, I believe that soul and spirit are used interchangeably in the scriptures. Um, that seems to be the case to me. And he goes to this text and says, well, look here. It clearly distinguishes between soul and spirit. And I had to tell him, that's not the point of the text. This text is not seeking to explain the composition of man. This, this point, the point of this text is to show that the Word of God pre penetrates a person to the deepest depths. It cannot escape it. It either softens us or it hardens us. It drives us away or it draws us to Christ. And on this point, it's easy to feel, just to illustrate, it's easy to feel as though the word isn't living when we see it preached among unbelievers and perhaps there's very little response. It may be hard to believe what it says here that the word of God is living and active. And perhaps we may even say that, well, maybe it only becomes living and active to those who respond. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It says it is living and active. All right, the fact is, to those who are in darkness, who do not receive the grace of regeneration, this word, living and actively, pushes them away because it's condemnation to their ears. As, as it says in John 3, you know, those who are in darkness run from the light. Right? It flees from it. Why? Because the light exposes that their works are evil. And this way they want nothing to do with it. Nevertheless, that's still the word doing its work. But to those who are being saved, it is the gospel of salvation. And that's precisely then why there's such an urgency for the author, that we believe the word that has been preached and which we have received. No creature is hidden in his sight. All are naked and exposed to him who they must give an account. There's an urgency that true believers persevere in their confidence in Christ to the end, and they will. This happens in part by the chastening of the word. But all others need to be called into this rest for the first time and warned of the wrath to come. Therefore, there is that abiding relevance to the word of God. So if you belong to Christ, then pursue him with eagerness in that promised rest that is yours in him. Celebrate the Sabbath and keep it holy as a rest unto God, looking forward to that end for which He created all things, and pursue obedience in every way from a heart of faith. And if you have not, or if you know someone who has not fled to Christ and asked the question, what are you waiting for? Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart, because this Word examines us, it exposes us to be a sinner liable to judgment and wrath, before a holy and good God, yet it offers to us the only way of salvation, Jesus Christ. And so come to Him and find rest by receiving Him as your Redeemer, as your righteousness, and know that you have eternal rest for your souls. Let's pray. Father, as always, we thank You for this Word. And God, we do ask that You would work in us such a mighty work to free us from distraction, Lord, to set aside all the things that would compete for our affections, for our time, for our desires. Lord, that we may focus ourselves solely upon you and your goodness and the grace that you have offered to us. And not only that, Lord, but help us to minister this grace to others, to offer out a, a, a defense for the hope that is within us, and God, simply give us what we need for faithfulness each and every day, that daily bread, even now as we come before you at your table. God, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.